Hi everyone, so today I wanted to, to bring back some more of my discussion of A Song of Ice and Fire. And in particular, I want to ask the question, does Grey Water Watch move? Now I know what a lot of you are thinking. You're thinking, of course Grey Water Watch moves. Uh, we're told it moves. And uh, actually, are we told it moves? I think it's, it's not necessarily certain. Uh, the quotation you'll usually get when you're asked about uh, the source of Grey Water Watch moving is from the fourth uh, brand chapter of A Clash of Kings, uh, where he is discussing uh, Grey Water Watch with Mira Reed, and uh, Mira mentions that ravens can't find Grey Water Watch no more than our enemies can. Why not? Because it moves, she told him. Bran had never heard of a moving castle before. He looked at her uncertainly but he couldn't tell whether she was teasing him or not. Uh, so I think in this uh, source, we're sort of explicitly being positioned with, this might not be true, it could be a joke, and indeed a lot of the characters do joke with each other throughout the book. Uh, so we sort of have a question of, you know, is, is uh, Mira Reed being serious? Does Grey Water Watch actually move, or is she sort of putting that out in jest? Uh, but there's actually a few other sources we might use, to uh, to investigate Grey Water Watch uh, moving, sort of in in the in the books themselves. The next one is from the World Book, A World of Ice and Fire. So, what does A World of Ice and Fire say about Grey Water Watch? Well, Grey Water Watch isn't sort of mentioned explicitly in its section on the Cranog Men in the North. Last, and some might say least, the peoples of, uh, of the peoples of the North are the swamp dwellers of the Neck, known as Cranog men, for their floating islands on which they raise their halls and hovels. Uh, and that's all it gives, really, of a description of, of the Cranog men. They're described as being floating islands, uh, but it doesn't mention moving. I mean, you could, we might sort of infer that floating means moving, but moving and moving enough as to, to sort of be considered a moving castle. You know, if it sort of sways back and forth within its its own lake or something, uh, it's quite different from, you know, moving long distances enough as to to really be as enigmatic as a lot of us would imagine uh, with the term moving castles and particularly that reference to not being able to be found by enemies or ravens. Our third and uh, final source, also uh, confusingly called A World of Ice and Fire, is in fact the, the A World of Ice and Fire phone app uh, which sort of gives nice uh, little references and is easy to, to keep in mind when you're reading the books to, to be able to quickly look up characters or locations that you don't remember. Uh, and it's also very intriguing for, for things like this because it's one of the few sources we have on A Song of Ice and Fire and sort of the world of Westeros that is written uh, in a sort of objective manner. Uh, so, for instance, the world book that we just referenced, as well as things like Fire and Blood, are all referenced in the world, written by maesters, that uh, just as modern historians can get things wrong and have sort of modern political biases in history books and in the news, so do the maesters. Uh, and, of course, in the, the main A Song of Ice and Fire novels, everything's written through characters' points of view. Uh, the app, generally speaking, is is something that we don't have that sort of in-character, in-universe perspective on. Things it says are can be taken as fact in ways that uh, the books and, uh, and other sources might not necessarily be being portrayed objectively. So this is, is sort of make or break. So what does it say? Greywater Watch is the seat of House Reed in the Neck, just south of Moat Kalen. It is built on a Cranog, a man-made floating island. And it is said ravens cannot find grey water because of the way it moves around. Which uh, sort of underwhelms that introduction I just gave to it, uh, because while the app itself is, is again, portrayed sort of uh, without that in-universe perspective, it's something we can take a bit more objectively uh, without the, the in-universe biases and perspectives of other sources. But when it gets to saying that uh, grey water watch moves, it immediately goes back into that perspective. We're just getting that that biased, unsure perspective from my first source, uh, from that conversation with Mira Reed. Uh, I mean, it says it is said we we might conclude to this that more than just Mira, Mira Reed says that Greywater Watch moves, 
Uh, but I think it's worth noting that when we had the chance to get an objective, uh, an objective way of, of describing this moving Cranog that none of our other sources have given so far, it deliberately and decidedly doesn't do that. It is portraying uh, the Cranogs as something that might move, and I definitely think that's something, you know, we shouldn't write out. You know, we, we should be open to that possibility, but I think also all of the sources always sort of have have a bit of like touching it with a 10-foot pole where nobody actually wants to go ahead and say in a, in a very certain manner that Greywater Watch or these other Cranogs do in fact move. Everything is, is very much sort of putting it away as it's maybe it moves. Some people say it moves. You know, it moves unless she was joking about it moving. You know, we, we don't have any source that we can really say with any certainty is really going out there and, you know, sort of putting their money on the table saying, yes, Greywater Watch moves. That just isn't something that happens. Uh, so now, like my other A Song of Ice and Fire videos, I want to go and talk about some real-world history. And in particular, I'm going to, to talk about two general topics, one of which is Cranogs, uh, and the other one is cultural packages. And we'll talk about Cranogs first, uh, because they're theoretically a bit of an easier topic to understand. Uh, so yes, Cranogs are in fact a real thing. Uh, they occur mostly in Ireland and Scotland, uh, and they perform generally the same way. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Ireland first, just because I'm, I'm more familiar with Cranogs in an Irish context. Uh, so Cranogs are... Uh, similar to the Cranogs of our, our fantasy series here, man-made islands. Uh, the big difference is the Cranogs in our real world are, aren't are floating. They're always in some way grounded. Uh, most commonly, they build up a fake island by putting layers of sort of rock and earth into a lake to build up a, a platform of earth and sort of make an artificial island, really. Uh, and the other one is they will, you'll drive stakes into the bed of a lake and build a, a sort of standing platform. Uh, so rather than being, you know, a big artificial island, you basically have a platform on stilts. And then onto this platform, whether it's that artificial platform or the uh, artificial island, you generally put down another layer of earth. Uh, and then onto that, you build up uh, settlements, similar to the way, again, that we have described in uh, in A Song of Ice and Fire with the hovels and huts. It's the same thing. Uh, you will build houses and a few other structures, uh, usually a nice big palisade or fence uh, around it. And uh, sometimes you'll get a, a little walkway from the Cranach to uh, the lake shore or whatever body of water. Uh, to provide entryway, although usually that, that entrance is a bit obscure. Uh, so, for instance, rather than being a nice sort of bridge across, uh, if you do have a bridge, there'll usually be some sort of removable element, similar to a drawbridge uh, that we'll find in sort of uh, later castles of the medieval era. And uh, other times it'll actually be sort of a walkway, but under under the water. So the water might go, you know, still sort of uh, up to your calves or something. Uh, so if you don't know where the walkway is already, if you're a stranger, you might not know the, the correct path to go through and not fall into the lake. Uh, and these also tend to be the defensive sites we have in early medieval Ireland. Uh, so until we get really get the introduction of castles uh, with the Anglo-Norman invasions or uh, even the fortified towns, that we get uh, sort of with the Viking incursions. We don't really have a lot of purpose-built fortifications in Ireland. Uh, I mean, we have a few things. So for instance, uh, the, the great hill forts that we think of uh, that are sort of stereotypically Celtic in a lot of ways. There's a few of those in the early Middle Ages, uh, but largely they're, they're a product of prehistory and just some of them continued in use to the early Middle Ages, but they're not building these hill forts anymore so often. Uh, and even some of the hill forts that do see continued use uh, sort of move away from being sort of in use settlements towards more ceremonial centers. You know, they'll go there for the inauguration of the king, but the king doesn't live there and it's not really in use as a hill fort. Uh, likewise, we have ring forts, which are sort of misnamed. 
Uh, they were thought to be fortifications uh, originally, but uh, as more and more research has been done, they seem more like uh, sort of semi-fortified farmhouses. Uh, and while they have, again, a, a bit of an earthen bank, usually with a, a palisade around it, uh, it's sort of a lot more like the fence on a modern farmstead, uh, where it's, it's more delineating sort of the edge of, of, that, uh, of that farmstead more than it is actually a, a protective measure against, you know, bandits or whatever. So Cranogs, on the other hand, do seem to be built primarily defensive. Uh, of course, you have the, that natural defense of being an island. You know, people can't go up and walk up to your walls in the same way they could those other settlement sites. Uh, as well as uh, these tend to have a lot more military artifacts. Uh, so weapons are much more commonly found uh, in early medieval Cranogs than they are in, in the hill forts or definitely more than the ring forts. So these are small, you know, relatively small, uh, generally artificial islands used primarily for defense. Uh, I said generally artificial because while I talked about artificial islands mostly, and that's sort of how we defined a Cranog today in, in uh, sort of archaeological and historical terms, it's worth noting that in medieval Irish sources themselves, uh, the word they use isn't Cranog, uh, uh, although Cranog is from an, a medieval Irish word, it just isn't used as common. And most of the sites that we would associate as Cranogs are usually called Inish. Uh, which is the Irish word for island. And there isn't really a, a, as strong a distinction between these man-made man Cranog artificial islands and just a natural small island that was being used for the same purpose. I mentioned that they're fairly common in Scotland as well, uh, as well as a few other places, mostly uh, in Britain. So we have a few in Wales, for instance. Uh, and those generally fall in the same general trend as the Irish Cranogs. The big difference is, uh, at least in Scotland, less so in Wales and the rest of Britain, the Scottish Cranogs do seem to have a slight chronological difference. Uh, so while the Irish Cranogs are early medieval, a lot of the Scottish Cranogs seem to be uh, pre-medieval Iron Age more than actual medieval. Although there is some continuity and there are Cranogs used uh, in, in Scotland in the early Middle Ages, and uh, some of those uh, Welsh ones are, are seem to be primarily uh, medieval as well, with some Iron Age use. So I think it's pretty easy to see the influence there. The Cranogs of A Song of Ice and Fire, of Westeros, seem to be very much modeled off of these medieval and late prehistoric Cranogs we have in Britain and Ireland. Uh, really the only difference is the, the Cranogs of of Westeros seem to be floating islands rather than sort of built up stable islands, uh, which does, you know, bring in the possibility of moving islands. Again, I don't think we should dismiss it outright. Uh, these, these are definitely just a fantasy version of the Cranogs of the real world, and maybe moving and floating is part of that fantasy element. But uh, it's worth remembering that the Cranogs that we have in the real world are similar in every respect except that they move. Uh, and again, we don't know, certainly, if they move. Uh, so I think it's, it's worth keeping in mind. And I just wanted to, to talk about Cranogs a bit because I think they're neat. Uh, so the other subject I said I wanted to talk about was that of cultural packages. Uh, and a cultural package is, is sort of a, a group of, of similar cultural items and concepts that tend to all move together as one uh, in ways that, uh, that sort of again, as a unit, as a package, uh, rather than just being able to take piecemeal bits of culture. Uh, it's much more common that cultural and cultural I ideas move as this package. Uh, so for instance, we might talk about Christianity and Romanism. Uh, so for instance, when early medieval Ireland becomes Christianized, it includes a lot of other aspects of culture that we might generally see as Roman culture. Uh, so, for instance, while there is a, a writing system that seems to emerge possibly in pagan uh, pre-Christian Ireland, although there is some debate, and it might be a development in sort of the Christianized parts of Ireland as well, we don't get things like books. Uh, books only enter Ireland during Christianization. Likewise, a lot of other elements of Roman culture 
seemed to enter Ireland during the early Middle Ages uh, after Rome falls, and definitely after the nearer parts of Rome fall, uh, for instance, Roman Britain, uh, is really when we see Ireland sort of adopting a lot of Roman culture, rather than, you know, sort of adopting Roman culture when Rome is right next to them. Uh, so, for instance, we have copies of the medieval books on the histories of Rome, and a lot of references to classical literature in medieval Irish sagas. And this makes a lot of sense when you really think about it, as part of their Christianization efforts. Because Christianity, of course, sort of requires you to have books, uh, in that the Bible is really important. Uh, and if you're educating people on how to read, you're going to teach them how to read and write other books. Uh, and particularly as Christianity is coming from this Roman, uh, the Romanized world, a lot of the other books that are being taught and studied by the same monks and scribes that are leading the Christianization efforts are going to be things like the history of Rome and uh, a lot of the Roman uh, literature of, of ancient Roman heroes and Roman myths. So even though uh, we might see Christianity as something uh, sort of particularly uh, isolated, I guess, removed from these other elements of the pagan past of Rome, by bringing in Christianity, the, the education system that's also coming in to educate uh, new, you know, the new priests, new clergy, and new Christians in, in the world is also going to bring education in classical Roman culture and classical Roman literature. Uh, likewise, we might say things like wine. Wine is important in Christianity as part of the, the celebration of the Eucharist. So if you're being Christianized, you're also going to bring in things like more trade so you can get access to wine, uh, or even the possibility of growing wine yourself, which wasn't done in Ireland before. Um, it's not a, a climate that's particularly great at growing grapes. Uh, so you're tying in to Roman culture in a lot of ways because of this adoption of Christianity. It's not just, you know, slapping a cross on everything and continuing the, the Celtic uh, culture, uh, although, of course, the, the term Celtic culture is a bit problematic, but we'll skip over that for now. But you can't just slap a cross on, on your culture and keep going, uh, particularly in this, this sort of early uh, ancient world. And the adoption of Christianity is naturally going to bring in other elements of the Roman world. And this is something uh, we notice in A Song of Ice and Fire as well. Uh, not so much in, in the neck, uh, because we, we don't really have eyes on what's happening in the neck. But uh, we can see it in the Ironborn chapters uh, over in the Iron Islands, where sort of the use of maesters, seps, knighthood, all of these things are sort of viewed in the same cultural package. Uh, you know, if you're bringing in maesters, they're trained in the citadel which is connected with the faith of the seven. Uh, you know, they're, they're bringing in the Greenlander ways. Uh, likewise, knighthood is explicitly tied with the faith of the seven. You have to be a, a follower of the faith of the seven to be a knight. Uh, so it's, and they, the, there's a lot of culture class over this. Since characters who don't trust maesters are also skeptical of these other Greenlander ways. They're very much tied together, again, in the same cultural package. You can't just take in the, the faith of the seven or just have maesters. You sort of need to take in an all or nothing cult, uh, approach to the cultural package of the, the Greenlander ways. And I think that's a much better explanation of a lot of the things going around uh, with Greywater Watch. Uh, if they're particularly sort of of the Old North, uh, and then they still use bronze uh, implements instead of iron. They still follow the old gods. They're very much set in this pre-Andal uh, first man culture. And that includes this cultural package of things like maesters. Uh, then it would make sense that they're sort of out of the loop with maesters. You know, it, it's the maesters aren't as informed about it because there's no maester there. Because maesters are rejected as part of that Andal a cultural package, which means they don't have a way to send or receive ravens because they don't have a maester to tend those ravens. Uh, it's harder for, for them to get good first-hand accounts uh, when the Citadel is compiling information because they don't have researchers there. 
uh, if the maesters are making the maps, and again, we know they're educating the lords and doing that sort of thing, then they wouldn't be able to, to well know where Grey Water Watch is for those same reasons. Uh, so I would argue that it makes a lot more sense uh, for Grey Water Watch not to necessarily be moving, uh, but instead everything can be explained by Cranogs acting much more like Cranogs do in our real world, and instead it's just that the culture of the Cranog men never accepted this Andal cultural package that would put them into the Maester network. Uh, and of course I could be wrong. It's possible that uh, if the if more books are released, that we'll find something that proves Grey Water Watch does move. And I'm definitely open to the idea that Grey Water Watch does move. But I think it's worth taking a step back and realizing that we actually don't have enough good evidence to treat the moving uh, nature of Grey Water Watch as a, a canon idea that a lot of people seem to have accepted it as.